Hi guys, today with us we have Coach McKay from Penn State. He's been coaching for a while now. He coached some incredible athletes, All-Americans, NCAA champions. He was NCAA champion himself. His father was his coach when he started. He's going to share with us a little bit of his coaching philosophy, recruiting requirements, what is he looking for in potential athletes. And make no mistake, guys, Coach McKay is a smooth talker. He's going to talk you in, lure you to his university, and then, and then give all his time and effort to make you a better thrower and a better person at the end of it. So, Coach McKay from Penn State. All right, Lucas McKay, thank you for coming. Absolutely, Martin. Thanks for having me, man. It's uh, good to catch up and uh, make some productive time during this crazy times we're having. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. How is it for you guys over there? Everything, I guess, shut down, I guess, the same as here, right? Yeah, social distancing. And, um, you know, this all started when we were at NCAA indoors. And, yeah. you know, it was the days leading into, uh, you know, pre-meet, exercising, shaking out, going to the gym, going to the track. And there was talk about it, and there was, you know, a little bit of talk about, uh, oh, did you hear Harvard didn't get on the plane? Yeah. Yeah. And there was that talk, you know, this was maybe two days prior. So it was like mm, March 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, somewhere in there. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's wild to think what difference 48 hours to make. Because we got on the plane coming out to New Mexico and mm. we took the precautions of hand sanitizer yeah. Yeah. Uh, for athletes. Like that was about as far as we took it. And that was taking some precautions. And yeah. it's wild to think in 48 hours, so 72 much. hours, maybe flying home that it was, you know, the anxiety and the feeling that you had yeah. taking that flight home of like looking around of like, oh my gosh, everyone yeah. who's infected, like it was wild. And, you know, for to be sitting at pre-meet dinner and I remember the TV was on and it was closed captioning with the NBA and they were talking yeah. about one or two players testing positive and then yeah. the NBA season was canceled and it was on the TV that night. And I remember the athletes were sitting on the left side and the coaches were on the right side and the conversation on the right side of the table was like, Whoa. so if NBA is canceling, what's that mean for us? And, you know, I was just trying to be in the moment as best we could. And um, like I said, what a difference 48 hours makes. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, since then, since being home, it's been the first few days was optimistic and, oh, okay, maybe it'll be a few people allowed. Maybe yeah. we can train a little bit like the, you know, the – the USA, NCAA, mm -hmm. you know, level uh, athletes, maybe they'll be allowed to stay around. And then that quickly, obviously, got shut down. And then, you know, everyone's dispersed and went home. And then online classes shortly thereafter. And then we, you know, it took about a week to, you know, that second week get settled in of like, okay, this is, this is how we're living now. This is and this is what it's going to be like. And now we're in week four. And it feels like, it feels like a year to me. It feels like it's been wow. a year. That, that's exactly um, how I feel as well. The time is going so slowly. Uh, this is the season, right? We're in the season usually. Uh, but I haven't had a spring off in my adult life. Wow. So, wow. you know, if, uh, I, was, I was old for my class. So I was 15, 16, my freshman year of high mm -hmm. school. And then, you know, you're driving and then, you know, you have got track meets every, yeah. you know, whatever, every other weekend or every weekend in high school. And then you go to college. And that's basically, you know, maybe you get one or two weekends off, but yeah. Th and then since coaching, it's been basically every never. So that's that's a good point now uh, that you mentioned. You know, since your early childhood, how did you get into throwing and your path through high school, college, and and professional? Right. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Modesto, California, um, and <clears throat> there was um, a really high level meet called the S and W relays that was held at Modesto junior college, which is where my father was a coach and my father coached um, defensive line and special teams in football. And then was the throws coach for track and field. So from kindergarten on, um, you know, I would go down to the college after school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the way through elementary school, you know, some days mom would take me down to the school and I would hang out at practice. That was basically daycare. And then from about sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade on, I would ride the bus down the road, uh, not that far, just across town. And then I would be at practice. So 
I was, you know, I'm a visual learner um, and fast forwarding, looking at all those reps that I was seeing that yeah. I wasn't really realizing. So I think that's where some of the technique came from was just watching, 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 and then I was able to imitate. So my dad was a track and field coach at the community college level um, at Modesto Junior College. And then I was able to see that with like that world class meet. Carl Lewis was there. Um, I was able to throw the discus with Dan O'Brien when the Dan and Dave wow. multi-event uh, push for the 96 games was going on. So yeah. um, just being around college kids, um, you know, was, was really cool and a yeah. good way to learn and see and strive. And those, you know, all those people at those time, at that time, you know, were idols of mine and people that you can kind of look up to. So, yeah. um, but I liked all sports. I did football uh, in the fall and then I went to basketball uh, in the winter, and then I went to track outdoors. Uh, my first two years of high school and some of my youth, I did swimming as well. So in California, pretty good weather all around, you know, year round. So you're able to kind of, uh, you know, take advantage of the weather and uh, play all the sports. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was I was good with football. Uh, I think my first recruiting letter was actually for basketball, which I was pretty, you know, really? pretty excited about. Basketball was my life for a number of years. Um, was it Sacramento Kings or, or – uh, which? Yeah, I mean, Sacramento, Kings. Sac Sacramento team right in my era was when Vlade – Yeah. And they had that big run, and it was them yeah. and the Lakers all the time. That was the, really the, yeah. fun. A lot of Divots and uh, – yeah. yeah. Stojkovic, yeah. They were, Stojkovic, yeah, yeah. I couldn't yeah. remember the guard. Um, yeah, that was that was a blast because it was also Northern California versus Southern California. Oh, okay. With Lakers Kings. So oh, there was yeah. this, like – little civil war action going on <laughs> yeah. with the basketball. Um, that's cool. From Oakland John to Lula. Sacktown, right? Like yeah, the bear man. in the back down. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You got your hip hop lingo. Got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. They were, they were competitive actually when for high school basketball in our area, like the state playoffs for Northern California would go mm -hmm. through Arco arena, which is where the Kings played. So we got a chance to play there uh, my awesome. junior and senior year in the, in the state playoffs, which was really cool. So, yeah, man, uh, like if you asked me during high school, like what's your favorite sport, it would be whatever was in season. Uh -huh. uh, track was, was very fun, um, and it was co-ed, and it was outdoors, and it was the last sport of the season. So, you know, it, you would end off on a really good note. But football in, you know, in the U.S. and in, in semi-rural areas, you know, mm -hmm. like – you know, Central California or, or Texas. And I mean, mm -hmm. football was huge, man. We yeah. have a really good team and we had like the same um, offense and defense from like the youth level mm -hmm. through the junior high level into the high school. So the high school was really good. Uh, I went to two different high schools. I went to Central Catholic High School in Modesto for two years and then transferred out to Houston High School, which was a more rural town out in the country. Mm -hmm. But my junior year, we were 13 and 0 in football. Nice. And undefeated and won a state title, which was really great. Yeah. Uh, there was, um, I think, five Division One athletes wow. on that team. On so, team. you know, and pretty much everyone played at least two sports, if not three. Wrestling was really big at the school. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, being an athlete was very highly valued, like yeah. where I grew up. So I went to school. I got decent grades. And, you know, sports were very important yeah. to me. Um so then, yeah, that led me to um, each year got a little bit better in the throws. Mm -hmm. But since my dad was a throws coach, I think he was very cautious not to be the, you know, little league dad and push to too hard. To force that upon you, right? Exactly. So he let me, he would kind of like, he'd make me come to him and ask, hey, like, mm -hmm. can we practice on the weekend? Or, hey, I want to, uh, I don't know, throw hammer more because – um, like most places, Hamer is in the sanctioned event, so I'd saw I'd see it, but I didn't really have that many meets. I think maybe in like July in the summers, I'd have maybe two meets, mm -hmm. you know, USATF open meets or whatever um, in the summer, and then my sophomore year maybe three or four, junior year maybe mm -hmm. four to six, you know. So just each year got a little bit more serious, yeah. but it wasn't. I think by my junior year. Uh, in the throws, we were basically in the off season, like during football and during basketball, we would maybe go like on Sunday, go into the gym and like throw some mm -hmm. balls and just like keep the technique fresh so that come w whenever we started outdoor yeah. season, it wasn't completely rusty. Uh -huh. So 
I think every year we would go from our last basketball game, you know, we play on a Friday night and, you know, lose that game. And then Saturday morning I'd be at a high school invite. Wow. And, wow. Slot. and that was completely awesome. And like yeah. that, that was, I would have it no other way. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, ended up having some good high school success through uh, 203 in the discus, so 62 uh, meters, yeah. and then 67 in the shot um, with a 200-pound bench <laughs> and, and long arms. And just, you know, I think it was more of a technician than, a, you know, a power thrower for sure. But had some good success um, there, and it's highly competitive in California. Yeah. As you know, you know, you got Coach Sorelli and Coach Pendleton in Southern California, and you've got mm-hmm. three to four in Northern California. You know, and they're all students of the sport, and their high school programs are as good as any college program, yeah. and they've got 40 years' experience. So, you know, the kids that really liked the sport and want to delve into it, um, Coach Sorelli's, you know, he posts his top 10 list every once in a while, and you get yeah. to see like how deep it is. Yeah. And so, in order to be in the final, you got to be a 200 footer, which is, you know, wow. It's kinda, wow. Wow. It's kind of cool. So I have an athlete now that I'm coaching Tyler Merkley, who's primary lay hammer thrower. And uh-huh. he got overlooked by a lot of people because he's undersized. He's six foot, but like he threw 197. That's you know, awesome. it's like, okay, so you get good coaching and, uh, you know, as it is like you've, you've had great groups in the past and you know that like, okay, is, is what is 20 meters now? And it's like, yeah. you need to get, to be that good to get on the bus. That's crazy. <laughs> so that's kind of how California high school yeah. like felt to me was, um, you know, 60 feet and 180, let's say, yeah. you know, when the discus was like, okay, now, now you're in the varsity. Like you're, you're, you can actually make a final. So, wow. but um, as far as like kind of who was ahead of me, like Susie Powell, who's, you know, Amer- former American record holder, yeah. three or four time Olympian in the discus. Yeah grew up in my same hometown. Okay, so okay. she's four years, I believe four years older than me. Mm-hmm. So I was watching her news clippings and seeing her in the paper. Yeah. yeah. And uh, NCAA champ, right? She was yeah, NCAA champ and Olympian while in college at UCLA. Mm-hmm. So Susie kind of, in my mind, paved the way for, for just like, Oh, this could be done. Someone from mm-hmm. my town did it. And, yeah. you know, I would see her at the track from time to time. And they would come out to the community college on Sundays and throw. And nice. I watched her dad coached her. So, you know, the, it was kind of paved that way. Um, um, so, yeah, I want to give props to Susie, you know, for, yeah. for doing what she did. And uh, Incredible. Incredible ambassador for sports. Incredible athlete and incredible person. Absolutely. She she had went away from the sport for a while and has just gotten back into the sport yeah. these last year or two. And um, that's really come full circle. And was able to see her at Ironwood Camp uh, throwing camp this last summer, yeah. and is now coaching at the community college, which is really really cool. That's awesome. Getting back yeah. to the sport. Yeah, man. Yeah. So yeah, um, that was high school. Then you know, I, I I was being recruited for two sports. This is the tricky part. Is then okay? So yeah. uh, I was a top rated football player, and um, I was being recruited by some Big Ten schools and some Pac Ten schools at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, being a California kid, I was interested in primarily Pac-10 schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and I took my visits. I took five visits. Um, I liked, you know, USC, UCLA, Oregon, Washington, Arizona. And those are my visits. And it's funny because I look back now and think about how similar those schools are. Yeah. You know, they're all, they're all in the same conference. Um, the only difference is school colors and, you know, campus and temperature so yeah okay you're gonna have, you're gonna have rain you're gonna have desert you're gonna have traffic that, that's a great point there's something most people uh, most people don't realize uh and then something we talked about how similar those conferences are right? especially pac-12 now right uh, what, what was your experience was pretty much they're all the same but just a little different colors right because they are a great academic school they're great sports schools right yeah and we know now as coaches and gone through it that um, you know, Pac-12, ACC, SEC, Big Ten, you know, there's there's some commonalities amongst, mm-hmm. you know, the conferences. And, um, you know, there's some differences across the conferences when you look at them uh, financially, athletically, uh, academically, um, when you look at that. So I think that's something interesting for, for parents and recruits mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, folks to look at is, uh, you know, maybe what type of school are you looking for? Because yep. at the time, 
seventy uh, percent of my decision, maybe ninety percent of my decision, was based off of athletics. Yeah, yeah. and in my mind, uh, the the degree was going to be presented to me if I did the work. Mm-hmm. So it was, you know, sports first. And, and th- that's important. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that because that's most us, right, athletes, and now athletes that we're recruiting. That's their kind of. Think, uh, rational thinking, right? That's what they're thinking about as well. Yeah, yeah, it might be. And that's, you know, that's interesting. And I think with uh, the podcasting that you're doing and some of the questions that you're asking and providing for prospective student athletes out there and parents, if they're listening, yeah. I think it's important to, you know, put, put your priorities down. And there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, listen, like, if you're a, you know, top level, top ranked blue chip mm-hmm. recruit, and you're re- let's say you're relatively smart you get good grades pretty easily okay fine it's okay to say uh, sports are most important to me and because i'll get a degree and that's okay yeah, and i'll yeah. you know i'll get that I've, i coached a few athletes that very much we hardly talked about school because they got a's and b's it seemed to come easy to them they did the uh-huh. work but it it, w- it wasn't you know a big struggle mm-hmm. and so you know very much we put a lot of focus on uh you know the athletic part so yeah. Yeah, so uh, I took my visits and looked at, um, I ended up going to USC, um, and my recruiting process was a lot different because I'm going on a football visit, and then, track, right? yeah, then it's like it's like one day with football, half a day with track, and then finishing with football, so I look back at that and think about how interesting that was to juggle and how it would be for us bringing in a two-sport yeah. athlete, which is so uncommon now. Mm-hmm. Um but in my signing class, we had five athletes that did football and track at wow. SC. Yeah, we had really? five athletes. Wow. Um, skill, uh, you know, receiver, receiver, running back, defensive back, lineman. It was wow. primarily skill kids that were really good in track. But that, you know, brings back to just the, the depth of high school uh, track in California. But we had five kids in my class, which is wild to think about and how that uncommon is, that is yeah. now. I haven't signed any kids that have played football and then thrown um maybe maybe at the smaller schools it doesn't have exactly it doesn't happen at d1 level as much as it did before right you say something like this is very specific or you know, california too and we'll talk about that how long history of throwing you have it was mecca of throws right it's really unusual it's really to see that these days anymore yeah it's uh yeah, that's a fun topic. I feel like it's a very small percentage of people in the athletics world, whether it's strength and conditioning mm. or, um, you know, or coaching either football or track that understand that, uh, you know, a lineman or a linebacker, you know, probably has all the tools or, you know, you see the statistics after the national championship game every year on Twitter of like 47% of these kids were all state. Yes. You know, in, in in the long jump, the shot, but the 100 meters, whatever it is, ath- athletes are athletes. Um, it's may, maybe just a little bit more appealing to a certain demographic to play football because, you know, there's the allure of the NFL yeah. and, uh, you know, a full ride scholarship in football because it's a lot easier to get that money in football. Yeah. How, when did you realize, so now you're at, uh, you took all your visits at the same conference? Was that it? visits i end up uh, going to usc okay and it's it's football first because it's you know in the fall so football is first and then track um and i uh interesting piece about that recruitment yeah my dad being a coach he very much let you know my parents you know let me make the decision as far as the recruitment but the one thing that he said is get get it in writing that they were going to let you um, do track during track season and not have to do spring football. The spring football, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, the one piece I thought that was, uh, you know, I didn't know at the time what that meant, you know, yeah. uh, just not having to think about it, it as, as a kid, yeah. Right. You just, okay, if football's over, then you, you know, you got this time in between. And I always played basketball in high school, so I didn't quite know what to do there. But um, yeah, that was interesting because my freshman year at SC, we were, I was redshirted because you're a freshman lineman. So mm-hmm. very few freshman linemen play. You're undersized. They want you just yeah, to mature yeah, a year, yeah. get up to 300 pounds, get your bench yeah. press up, yeah. learn the offense a little bit more, and then you might get a chance to play. Um, yeah. I'd say it's a low percentage, maybe 25, 30% that actually play. That um, actually, and yeah. we, Grow we into the few, size, especially yeah. a school, like a football school like USC. USC like right? SC, sure. Yeah. We actually had one or two uh, freshmen in my class play, which um, to me was 
hard because I wanted to play. I, I just came from a state championship yeah. team, yeah. and you know we lost two games in in three years, kind of wow. thing. So I don't, I didn't feel like at my you know eighteen year old mind, I didn't really enjoy the process of practicing all the time in football. If I don't get to play, I want to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in track, you train, you train, you train. You kind of enjoy the process a little bit differently yeah. because you're you're really honing your craft and you're. And you know, you only have maybe four or five meets outdoor, right? It's not. Yeah, a, sure. Thirteen sure. games. So, that, so yeah, the, the football is a grind, and when you don't get a chance to play under the lights, it's it's, it's tricky to just do a, a retro year. But anyways, yeah. um, we went five and six or six and five. I can't recall, but it, that's not a good record, especially for a football school like USC. Yeah. So uh, the head coach was under some pressure, and so that get it in writing um, document that I had w- was still in my file. But you know the the question was, well, if you'd like to play, you need to be at football practice. Uh, so you know yeah. there was that little bit of gray area where uh, you know I I had to kind of make that decision as a as a very young adult, and yeah. I wasn't quite ready to make that decision. So. I'm at football practice, but I'm frustrated because I want to be at track practice because it's track season and we've got to meet on Saturday, but I've got to be at football practice Monday through Thursday and they're going to give me Friday off so I could travel. So, Mm. you know, that part's tough. And uh, when I look back at it, it's, uh, you know, I probably would have handled a little bit differently. Maybe you, you know, call a break, have a meeting and figure out what, what's what. And, um, you know, when it comes down to it, the best player probably is going to play. I don't think there was anything political. I just don't think they knew, you know, at the time, you know, they have to evaluate you. They got to see you play. So yeah, yeah, that was tricky. And, uh, you know, for the very few two sport athletes that are out there, that's a uh, difficult waters to navigate. But, yeah. um, so I ended up basically stepping away from football and going into track only. Um, so my freshman spring, and then I came back, um, my, second year sophomore year it was track only Mm -hmm. um but i ended up being kind of disenchanted with the whole environment anyways um and ended up leaving sc after three semesters so after my sophomore fall i uh, wanted to go another direction i didn't i didn't like being in los angeles i wanted how was that yeah how was that decision what made you uh, yeah because that's a big decision to make right you're a california guy you're a cali guy you're in cali school how was that yeah, hard to and, you know, the, Yeah, the funny thing about just being you – know, like, California is such a big state. You can be mm-hmm. from, you know, Houston, California, and not have a stoplight in your town. Wow. Which wow. is yeah. what Houston is. Like, no rural, stoplight yeah. in the town. Yeah, there's, you know, three exits and a lot of almond farming and a lot of rural families. And it was tremendous. It was great. I wouldn't trade that for the world. But then mm-hmm. getting yourself plopped down in the middle of Los Angeles – and not knowing how to navigate the highways, oh my gosh, you know, like you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't have asked, you know, to move the country boy to the city and be a bit more overwhelmed. So what I was looking for was, um, you know, the only college games and scenes I'd really been around, I would go up, we'd go up to Cal and watch some football games from time to time. We'd go over to Stanford maybe and watch some games. Yeah. And then there was a, a division two school in the area that we'd go watch basketball games that, but those yeah. felt more like college towns. So, you know, flying down and landing in the middle of L.A. Uh, was pretty overwhelming. And, you know, leaving campus at SC and, uh, you know, short of going to the grocery store yeah. was just like, I mean, you're, you're, you're lost. It's a massive city. So I was looking for a college town. And I knew after I left SC that that's what I was looking for, somewhere where, you know, the town shuts down after the students leave and there's, mm-hmm. you know, a smaller population and everything kind of revolves around the school. And, and after that, um, two years that I spent at Moore Park Community College, that's, I knew that that's what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the two years at Moore Park was, was really important as well for, uh, And as well, maturation yeah. and just yeah, maturity in general. Yeah. Figuring out what do you want to study, and then that's where uh, that's where Kipway came into my life, yeah. and where um, you know trying to figure out what event you really want to throw. Because I was still discus was number one. That's what I want to talk to you about. Sure. At all. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and then going to SC. 
Um, like we were in between discus and hammer, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot. And Dan has had a lot of success on the hammer. Um, yes. And so maybe, maybe hammer became one A and discus became one B because it was already pretty good. You know, he thought yeah. technically, so then it was just like, okay, do the work and you'll get better. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So going from SC to Moore Park college. So my dad was the coach at Moore Park. So I, you know, went from moving away to college to moving back home yeah. and being at home and then going right into, um, no more football and track and field. And so I think I redshirted that first spring, mm -hmm. um, or competed that first spring. I can't remember which was which, but I was there for two seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and then ended up getting talked into playing football one more year. Uh, I think that second year and then ended up getting talked into playing basketball for about oh, half wow. a season <laughs> this is really because you're at, you're at the community college. So you could, you could kind of yeah. be a good athlete and maybe get that done a little bit. But that was fun. I was able to get those sports out of my system, so I didn't have to go play yeah. murals. Um, but yeah, that's where I think I kind of matured as a thrower. Um, we played around a lot with uh, hammer technique and went from four, uh, four turns with the toe turn to four heel turns. Uh, I think we threw three turns for a while. Um, and, you know, this was early, very early internet. Yeah. So the amount of information out there, uh, you know, was far more limited. So, you know, you'd get a DVD on someone, you'd go to a clinic, um, you know, and still being in Southern California and being five, six hours from NorCal and being able to go to Uri clinic, maybe once a year, every other year. Uh, there were some people down in uh, Southern California as well, getting a chance to go up and see Lance Steele. So there was a lot of information and it was really early on. So I think we're really kind of trying to, learn and decipher and you know uh, figure out what kind of technique and what technical model yeah. and all those things uh, so that that was a really really great time yeah. um moore park was a, is such a hub because it was you're in the outskirts of los angeles uh -huh. so schools from the east coast would come out uh and do their spring break so you know we'd have east coast schools that would come out and they'd stop by the, the juco for two three days and train uh you know the weather's always 70 yeah. degrees and the throwing field there was, you know, big and on its own and easy to access. So that was very beneficial for, mm. for reps and just having people out there. Um, yeah. Lance, Lance deal came through a few times when he was coaching in Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. Koji Marifushi ended up coming through and doing training camps, like I think three years in a row or uh, three or four times in four years. Um, Yuri wow. came and did a clinic as well. Wow. And, um, or uh, Bonder Chuck came down with with Dylan, and you know it's greater LA area, so everyone yeah. wants to come through LA. Yeah. So that was, you can see why someone like Dan has hung around. SC oh, for oh definitely. I mean that that like I said, it was Mecca, Mecca, years. right? Throwing right. it. Yeah. So yeah, so What's that, that was um, that was a good time to discover things. Yeah. So this is really unique, and then you, you know be, you being at Georgia then right, and training with all these guys. Uh, how that impacted you, right? So you went from, and this is all. This is like I said, really unique because you don't have. You'll have athletes who do uh, two sports in high school. Rarely you'll see them do two sports in college, especially at the level you were, right? And then you were NCAA champ, and you were doing you were doing some football as well, right? In your earliest year of college, uh, only Kevin Bookout, I think, the one that I think of that can play, you know, play basketball and did really good in track. Uh, how was that in Georgia that you're obviously er, after everything you went through, finally, you, you know, you, you found what you're looking for. You were able to be an NCAA champ. Yeah. Uh, going to Georgia was great, man. I've, I've got a Georgia flag in my garage yeah. and I still keep in contact with uh, coach Babbitt. And, um, yeah, that was a really good time. And I connected with coach. Well, I knew kind of what I was looking for. Like I, I met earlier, I was looking for, you know, a, a college, town feel and a good athletic department um the sec is a great athletic conference i knew i'd be in warm weather uh you know all the factors that you're kind of looking for uh from a from a athlete perspective and uh i just got along seamlessly with babbitt he was a southern california guy so there was a good vibe there between yeah. the two of us and then kind of like uh coach newell had talked about we had known each other from norcal from high school yeah. and he was going on and being a transfer as well from a four year to a two year back onto a four year. So we were both in that same boat. Mm -hmm. uh, so we transferred in together 
um, and then uh, got a house with another uh, a Georgia athlete, um, which was really fun. We had to kind of uh, translate his his country Very slang for there. yeah for a few months before we could figure out what he was talking about. But um, but going into that group, so I got there in '03. Um, won an NCAA title in 03 and the hammer and um, I think did pretty I'm, I can't remember exactly you know, where I placed and those types of things but mm-hmm. over the two years um, was you know did well in the SECs and yeah. still I think by my senior year the spring I think I set the shot put down I, I don't think we competed um, maybe we did and uh, yeah. but I wasn't breaking any records or anything there so it was more so just points for the team and then yeah Elka Savage started coming in to yeah. Auburn and my, my eighth place didn't quite matter anymore. I think that got bumped <laughs> up maybe another meter or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was great. So, so at that time, um, the students of the throws would know that during that 03, 04 lead up, there were nine Olympians in the throws training under Don Babbitt mm. and thinking about it now from a coaching perspective to think, how many different training plans he was writing and like yeah. the different personalities he was managing and who was throwing at what time and like what those yeah. look like. Oh my gosh. It's, it's really wild. I think it takes yeah. a very special person to be able to just be even keel enough to manage that. Yeah. Um, but managing those people and those personalities is, is, was really cool. And to be, you know, 21, 22 years old and, be amongst that type of training environment. I mean, that's basically the Olympic training center. Yeah. You know, at, in, in an NCA, you know, institution, which is yeah. is wild to think about. No, um, like, it, like it, uh, so yeah, we talked about it. it cannot happen now. That that's what happened then, and that's it. Like that's that was OTC uh, in a college college uh, uh, environment, right? Yeah, environment. Sure. So it was it was Reese Hoffa, mm-hmm. and then his his future wife was my teammate Renata, mm-hmm. and and Adam Nelson and his future wife. Uh, yeah. was, who was not n- not a thrower, yeah. um, and then Brad Snyder and yeah. his uh, future wife. So that's you know, four. Yeah. And then uh, Jason Tunks came and mm-hmm. Jason's uh, wife. Yeah. So that's seven. And then there's Bro Greer. Yeah. And then Mike Hazel. Yeah. Um, and Andrush. Yeah. In the Hammer. Yeah. And Ivana came. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, when it came so, and, you know, uh, wasn't Cantwell uh, Christian Cantwell there a little bit? Christian would come through because Terry was there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so you know it was like a training camp type of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know that's, that's ten like, Olympians. Yeah, ten Olympians yeah, like, you know, at the same time. I wish that if you could rewind the clock and like video document a lot mm-hmm. of those, you know, the training sessions. But you know, being uh, a a student of the sport and hanging around those practices. I knew coming from California and seeing, you know, the professional throw and yeah. people like that come through that you can learn a lot by just watching and being around practice. Yeah. So I knew that toying around with the javelin a little bit, I knew that it was important that I learned javelin to become a good, uh, you know, proficient coach. Yeah. So I would hang around and go to Trevor's practices a lot mm-hmm. and I would hang around. I mean, bro, Bro Greer's training, and yeah. even if I didn't know what his distances were, he was such an electric personality that yes. you would want to hang around yes. and just yeah. see what he would do at training, anyways. Yeah. Um, American record. So I'd, you know, yeah, so I'd hang around practices a lot there. Um, when the guys were throwing shot, but hang around. Andres was training a lot with yeah. us or around us, um, and then you know the discus. You know, Jason had some of the best technique, and yeah. you know he. Like he's talked about, he's changed around his technique two or three times, but it's ninety yeah. percent similar. So he was someone I really kind of looked up to as well, and was was really to be able to train around those guys. I learned a lot. I remember going to uh, the swimming pool and going to the hot tub and learning a lot about recovery, learning yeah. a lot about nutrition from our strength coach, um, asking questions and getting real answers from guys like Adam Nelson and, mm-hmm. and bro and our strength coach, Rob McIntyre, uh, Rob, yeah, you know, yeah. strength coach to the stars. Oh um, my God. But, you know, uh, electrifying figure as well. I'm very creative. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, you know, I, very specific instances with each, each of those names thinking about like just really good uh, advice and life lessons that we're kind of yeah. learning during that time. Um, you know, and it's, 
it's great. Those opportunities are few and far between now. Like, like Newell was talking about, there's the coaching clinics and just learn by doing clinics. Yeah. Um, a lot of that stuff is moving online now, yeah. uh, which is great because it's, it can, it can reach a lot more people. But you know, in, in our day that was really common to just go to a weekend thing yeah. and hop on and learn some things. There's a lot of learn by doing. Uh, I mean, Tibor Gitchik came to, to campus yeah. and did a hammer clinic and that's, yeah. you know, I see it on YouTube and I can look back and I'm like, uh, not all of the pieces are in there. I remember, you know, there's a weight room session that's missing and, like, uh-huh, uh-huh. you know, it, you know, but what you, you, what we were able to experience was going yeah. to dinner with him afterwards and then taking him to the downtown and showing him around as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's unlike anything, right? Living, living and throwing, right? It's, it's the one thing that listening from, uh, from, a, you know, um, a class online or, you know, going even for a two day clinic, when you live with somebody for a whole year during their, the, the time of their training, that's a completely different thing. Um, one thing that I think you might not agree with me, but I think you, you never reached your potential. I, I think you were one of the most, most one of the most talented uh, throwers out there. I think you could have thrown so much further and I want you to talk about this a little bit. I think you lost a lot of time in between transferring, like between finding yourself, because I remember, and, and it's how important it is now, what you would do uh, now than before. I remember when you told me, you know, I was a discus thrower. I come to here, you know, 2005, uh, Lucas throwing some hammer, uh, you know, you're doing really well. It's obviously NCAA champion hammer. And you were playing around with discus one day, and a meet, you throw like nothing, you throw 58 meters. <clears throat> I'm like, wow, is that your PR? He's like, no, my PR is 60. I'm like, 60? Like I'm trying to throw 60 meters. I'm a discus thrower, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, I did some discus. And you now, you know, you told us you threw 67 in a shot in the high school. You threw 203 while while doing two other sports. Luke, this is really unique, right? So now I, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you're you're a modest person, right? I think you could have been one of the greatest. Uh, you will be throwing 70 meters, uh, or if you specified at the early age, obviously. You had that, you know, path that you had to take. Finally, you know, you found yourself at you know, becoming an NCAA champ. So you, you, you know, uh, made fruit of your talent. But how, what would you do differently now that you know? Uh, you talked about how you did all the visits on one end, right? Just packed. Well, if you're in high school now, what would you do differently uh, in terms of recruiting or finding the place that you, uh, that you belong, right? Yeah, sure. No, I, uh, I appreciate that, man. And I, w- I would agree with you as well. I think I could have thrown further. Uh, I think I could have, uh, you know, I think once the hammer kind of took, took a hold that definitely took me down, you know, the hammer path, I think the discus path would, um, was, was pretty well worn. I think I could have thrown, I threw 60 meters, my freshman, freshman year or, um, redshirt freshman year. I can't, I can't recall when it was, but you know, right at 19 or something like that, which is, you know, that puts you up there in the rankings at that time. And this was, you know, 2000, uh, Oh one. So, um, but yeah, I think, like I said before, like my parents really sat back, they both being former athletes, they didn't want to pressure me, but I yeah. think now that's a lot more uncommon. I think there's a lot more specialization early mm-hmm. on. Um, I really think that, um, being a well-rounded athlete is far more beneficial than specializing early on. Yeah. Um, there's a number of factors that lead into it. I think that's great, but once you do kind of make that, uh, make your mind up and make a decision as to what event or sport you're going into, I think that's great. Um, and yeah, I think spreading myself a bit too thin for, yeah. a, for a number of years, you're a jack of all trades and a master of none, yeah. which is, you know, I, I still think through junior, senior year of college, I was still like three days on you know, in, in one event. And then, you know, like we, I was still throwing the shot, but like once a week and, you know, and not, and I wasn't that strong upper body wise. So, yeah, you know, you're serving too many masters, I think yeah. is what was, was the factor for me. And I think what I would do with an athlete that I'm coaching is try to, uh, you know, let that conversation happen early, um, freshman year, you know, uh, during the recruiting process, talk about, okay, let's keep our options open two, three events. And then, you know, by year one, maybe that's going to hone itself down to two events. And then, you know, shot discus, no problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, shot hammer, discus hammer, whatever it is. Two events I think is manageable. I think it's good to have a backup event and have something 
when the shock button starts going bad or you tweak your hand or something, then, you know, that second event is there to keep your, your training up. And I think there's a really good reciprocation between those two events where they help each other. You can learn a lot, you know, proprioceptively and uh, spatially and that kind of stuff uh, with the two events. But I would want to have that conversation early on. Uh, freshman year and then have some type of back and forth with the athlete and you know obviously we've been in the sport for a long time and we have some knowledge about that we've seen things come and go so we could say okay these are things I've seen this is what I think for you might be best you know and then you know if they seem to agree and move with that then you can kind of have that conversation together and then go down that path together so okay Let's look at the season. There's three meets where maybe we want to throw both or, okay, discus is first at Florida Relays, so that's going to be good. And then shop for this day too. So, you know, and at, at the Virginia meets, it's, it's great because you, you can focus on one event per day. And so that's kind of how I would lay things out. And we've had some good success doing that, not trying to, you know, do square peg round hole and kind of get too busy with too much at yeah. once. And then you're not really getting your best out of either event. Yeah. Now, obviously, obviously that uh, experience from yourself made a big impact on you because obviously now in coaching, you can do that, right? You have an indoor uh, NCAA champ uh, who throws discus, right? So he's throwing the weight and he's really successful discus throw, right? Uh, obviously, hammer throws, you guys are, are killing it as well. So you obviously took that uh, experience. Uh, you didn't take it for granted, right? <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, you know, I think having a, a dad as a coach, um, I didn't know if I would get into coaching, but, uh, you know, I was always paying attention. I still think that I might coach basketball at some point. I still think that I might coach at some point. I just uh, it kind of just, you know, learning about sport is really fun, and I, I enjoy it, and I like it. And the, the team environment of basketball and football still really interests me, and I think it's really fun. Um, but, yeah, if you're paying attention, there's always things to be learning. Yeah. And then, you know, if you can implement them and have a good – you know, have some leadership qualities, obviously you can, you know, implement those like into your coaching, which is kind of what, uh, what, what I've done. Um, and at different levels, you get a lot of different, uh, you know, type of athlete. So, you know, I coached at high school, I've coached at division three, uh, the coach at small division one at Southeastern Louisiana yeah. and then, uh, Oklahoma state and Penn state, you know, when you get different athletes, in all those schools because they're coming from different places mm -hmm. they're looking for different things some kids you know <clears throat> one of the most a few of the most talented kids i've ever worked with mm -hmm. were at southeastern louisiana you know yeah. and yeah. well a few of them went there because that's this college that's closest to the, where they're from you know and then you know jeff miller iron got there because he's from upstate new york but he's got a connection with the coach and you know that's where yeah. he could get in and he slept in his truck for a while and got things yeah. worked out and then ended up being there. And, you know, he was a really talented athlete to work with and same deal. Like we probably, we probably did too much. We probably did too little, you know, and spread ourselves pretty thin. He probably could have had a lot more success yeah. in one particular event if we had just focused on that and trained for that. Uh, you know, but he was a bit of a team guy as well. So we threw the weight indoors to the shot, you know, uh, messed around with the hammer because he was, smart enough and knowledgeable enough in the sport to be like, Oh yeah, that's easy. And he's kind of, he was kind of a player coach anyways. He was mm -hmm. uh, a year or so older and knowledgeable enough that he wanted to help out and be a good team guy. So okay. that was a, that was a blast. It was a really good place to be. What, was that, was that something you were looking for? Cause so what, it, when you're recruiting, this is uh <clears throat> questions we get a, mo a lot, right? What type of athlete are you, or what are you looking for in an athlete when you're recruiting? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's the general question that is, you know, asked to all coaches yeah. and, um, it's changed over the years. You know, I, I've always liked having a group, um, you know, like I said, coaching high school first and then my first mm -hmm. college job was at a division three, division three is non-scholarship. So everyone's there cause they want to be there. And, um, you know, we would pack a cooler and go to meets and every, you know, it's this extension of high school is really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, you know, always 10, 12, 14 throwers. And, um, you know, I, I would prefer that. And at the further I'm getting down the line now and being in the power five, I think, um, honing that down to maybe, you know, 12, uh, you know, I think, I think it's kind of the cap 
um, for me, and it's quality over quantity. Uh, it is nice to have a group, have the training group, you know, spending that time at Georgia. I think the training group is the most, um, the like intangible factor that is kind of mm-hmm. unreachable if, if, if you have it or if you don't, you know, yeah. I mean, you had it at, with your group, with the guys, you know, it's, it, there's so much energy that can be created with a group. And obviously you can kind of be back and, you know, you're the coach, you're manipulating things, you're moving things around, you're kind of playing the puppeteer and, yeah. and you're moving things and you're motivating people different ways and different, yeah, yeah. you know, depending on how you do it and how he does it and you can get in and interject to move some pieces around. But then the, the athletes themselves kind of be the players and hold each other accountable and push and pull. And there's uh, some really good energy that can be exchanged that way. Yeah. So I think what I'm looking for now at Penn State, you know, I'm looking for um, a Pennsylvania, number one, uh, you know, number two. We've got a number of states around us that are, uh, you know, good in the strength and power sport. So, you know, I think regionally, uh, you know, I kind of look first. And then outside of that, you know, I probably have still have a lot of contacts on the West Coast. Um, so I look at that. But. Uh, Penn State's a top 20 public school, so you're going to get a quality education. You have a very large alumni network, um, so you're kind of joining uh, a very large family when it comes to the alumni. And, um, you know, I I jumped at the opportunity to to interview for this job because it's Penn State. And to me, like, just saying it's Penn State was enough because um, the the discus uh, school record uh, is held by a two sport athlete, football, uh, and track. Oh. Um, and then you've got obviously, uh, Joe Kovacs, you've got Jarrell Hill. Um, uh, Deshea Williams was the NCAA champion in the discus, uh, in 03, uh, same year I was in the hammer. And so I, I just, I've always known Penn State as having throwers. I've always had javelin throwers, one or two at NCs every year. So, you know, it's just one of those schools you've always seen around. So I jumped at the opportunity to interview, and then what I'm looking for within the program um, is self-motivated kids, students of the sport. Uh, they understand that uh, you know there's more to the throw than a uh, power clean, a squat, and five days of throwing. You know, um, I think uh, them understanding that uh, what what type of school Penn State is, what type of education you're going to get, what the balance between uh, work athletically and work academically is uh is really important but uh self-motivated um students of the sport and um you know people that that want to you know succeed in the sport yeah no that's uh that's great like you said you know sometimes uh you look for what was there in the past and then you see what you can bring and what what you have on a team right what kind of athletes you have on a team to recruit and what what uh benefits uh they will bring to the existing team obviously so you look at the uh, major breakthrough. You did some incredible things there. You have an NCAA champ. It didn't happen in a long time uh, before he came. You had, like you said, somebody like Joe Kovac and those guys uh, were living in an era of different athletes who are very good, so they never got to get that NCAA uh, title. But you made that happen there. Uh, now, in, uh, and I know I know the answer for, to this question, but it's something that gets asked a lot. What? What's your philosophy in terms of training? Does one more fits it all, or do you look at the athletes and you know see what they need to get better, right? In terms of writing a program, and I think that's important for uh, recruits to look at. Um, you know, if you um, me growing up, UCLA was the best throw school. Uh, there was one or two or three others that could argue that they were very successful as well. But, but obviously, growing up in California. Um, and Arvin uh, you know, was a longtime coach and very successful uh, in the shot put in discus. Yeah. So what I'm saying in that statement is they were very successful in the shot put in the discus. What the other side of that statement is, is they didn't really spend much time worrying about the hammer or the javelin. Yeah. yeah. So if you're a hammer thrower or you're a javelin thrower, do you go to the best program that has the best throwers? Because that means you would go to UCLA, but then what would happen with your throwing if you were a javelin thrower or hammer thrower. Now, eventually that ended up, you know, Art spent some more time with, with the hammer and yeah. developed Jessica Cosby from a shot putter into a, you know, near American record holder in the hammer throw. Uh, you know, it just took time and energy. So, but when you looked at, at the shot put in the discus, 
Um, the I remember thinking, like, watching the UCLA throwers in their redshirt year, you know, go to open meets, and, yeah. you know, they'd be in a white T-shirt, and they would throw, but you could tell they were a UCLA thrower. Yeah. They so would start a certain way. Right? Yeah, they would technically throw yeah. just like Godina was, and Godina was the model, and it was kind of set off of John Brenner a little bit. Um, but you know, you could you could put them in a different outfit and still know what school they threw for because that was the mold that was ha- you know that was proving success. And if it ain't broke, don't why, fix why it. Why change it? Worked at the time, right? Worked at the time. Sure. You know, and you can look. You know, in the in the shot put during those times, it was very low out of the back, and there was a bit of a rise of the hips and a bit of a jump in the middle, and then it was a very. Uh, um, dynamic double support in the front but there was it was up down and then this big up again into the front and there was this huge reverse and this big jump yeah but you know that's what everyone was doing because Godina was killing it and everyone was kind of following in that wake and trying to do what he did so yeah. if you're a tall lanky thrower that's not very strong what do you then do? yeah like you would have had to fit into that model so that was like in, in in my mind that was that was one option and then the, the other option was you know other other coaches i can't even name you know who, who they were at the time but i i definitely um was looking for something that was a little bit more uh you know organic and like okay what is martin bringing to the table okay uh very fluid long levers um you know best snatch in the in the ncaa and then okay <laughs> let's let's take those strengths yeah. develop those and you know develop the weaknesses so um, yeah, I mean, I'm as, it, like in the Penn State program, like I'm, I'm technique first. Um, I think just being raised around who I was raised around, seeing the people throw, like being exposed to a lot of different coaches. And I think a lot of high quality coaches at the high school, college and, you know, independent level. Um, and just spending a lot of time, you know, biomechanical studies and looking at VHS, uh, videos over the years and, um, you know, tracing, um, positions on tracing paper and then taking my videos and looking at those things, you know, it's early, you know, early eighties biomechanical stuff was, yeah. was really cool to me. And then trying to like mimic those positions. So I'm technique first, um, mental second and strength third. Um, yeah. I do think that the, the strength piece is uh, probably, I'd say, the hot topic amongst almost any and all throws coaches, any and all, um, you know, high-level throws prospects. Like, what do you do in the weight room? Mm-hmm. Um, and for the most part, like, you need to be pretty strong to throw these objects far. It's a 16-pound ball. There might be five guys, and there might be one guy in the NCAA final that benches under 400 pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there, there might be. But most yeah. likely everyone's so it's like okay you don't have to you don't have to um prioritize that but you have to have that you have to have that strength yeah. it helps so some, right? Right. Yeah, it's so like uh you don't you don't you don't need shoes to run but it helps right so you don't <laughs> need a big bench press to throw far or shuffle but it helps right yeah and some people like i know for myself like i couldn't hold strength in my upper body i could hold strength in my legs and back posterior chain and so like my clean it was always the best. My snatch was second. My squat was third. My bench and jerk were last. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so like some people, like I would have to, I probably would have needed a, a overhead press or, or, or press three day, three or four days a week, probably to yeah. sustain that strength and keep building. But I never did that. It was always once a week, maybe yeah. twice. So I just, I don't think I ever did it enough. So, um, you know, yeah. that's kind of how I prioritize. Um, we, I, I've done a few different things over the years. I think this is year 11 uh, in college coaching. Um, and I've done a few different things because, like, at first, you know, like many of us, like, we, I, I just implemented what I did. You know, my first few years of coaching was like, okay, this is what I did. This is basically my training program. Let's take 20% off of it and then give it to the athletes and yeah. see what happens. And, you know, you do that for a year or two and you're like, ooh, that's uh, they can't they can't get through wednesday so all right let me cut that back a little bit or you know whatever it is um okay let's let's a few less med ball throws maybe maybe puds once a week instead of three times a week uh you know those pieces but uh being influenced by uh you know coaches that i've uh you know bonder is you know a huge influence um 
uh, Derek Evely, you know, uh, paid a lot of attention to what they've done. Mm-hmm. Nick Garcia is, you know, kind of the, the authority uh, on on that now on, online, and he's been implementing a lot of that stuff. Um, but, it, yeah, like, technique first, I think, in the throws is massively important. You know, um, you're gonna always going to fall back on your – your hang clean, your yeah. squat, your bench press, whatever it is. But if the technique isn't there, then the consistency won't be there. And then maybe you're going to lean on the weight room a little bit more and then you're going to be frustrated. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different coaches around that do it a number of different ways. Uh, but I think over the, since I've, you know, come into college to now, I think there's a, a, a there's been a big shift from weight room first and then you're going to throw a little bit further. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then by your junior, senior year, we'll figure out, you know, how to reverse or whatever it is, something technical. But I think yeah. there's been a big shift to like a lot more te- technical model um, being, uh, you know, higher priority and mm-hmm. then, you know, finding different ways and not as cookie cutter. Um, I think, you know, the social media and the information sharing has been massively mm-hmm. important to, uh, you know, from, from 2000 to now it's you know it's a 20 year run there's been a lot of difference there yeah so well, I, I, and a lot of coaches now what i not a lot m- many coaches would say things things like oh i wasn't too strong you know I, I was never too strong i was always more technical uh i was only bench pressing you know 440 right so <laughs> when you know ask them how many did you press like oh 400 440 right that's a lot so uh, in your case i know this is true because i trained with you for a couple of years right what I really like, and you, it's really true, you were not a bench press guy. <laughs> you, couldn't throw, you couldn't bench press as much. And what I really like is your technique, man. You were so smooth. I remember you beating me in discus, right? And I'm like, this guy just flows. A consistent acceleration. You had a, such a smooth feeling for discus. And it makes sense when you when you uh, get to know where you came from, right? From the Desto area over there in Sacramento. Uh, one of the best fields, one of my favorite fields to throw, one of the favorite, most favorite one is Modesto. And you got Salinas, right? Uh, those places, right? Where they were uh, the best discus places in the world. And you grew up through that, right? And, uh, and just so you guys know, um, Coach McKay here, where he grew up at that field, where, uh, where he was, you know, come to track, where he's at with, uh, training. I remember one time I was sitting watching the discus because it would be a lot of sessions, right? And I was sitting next to this guy. And he's probably 90 at the time, right? And he's talking about, you know, some, you know, he's, oh, yeah, I used to throw a little bit of javelin. I'm like, okay, you know, where, where, what did you do? You know, I, oh, in college? Like, yeah, a little bit in college. And then after that, and then I went and won Olympics. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what? Like, who are you? <laughs> right? uh, so this is where you grew up, right? You grew up with some Olympic champions, Olympians. Your dad was a coach. You got that feeling. And I can see that in your athletes, right? You're not pushing that mall. Uh, fits all right you are pushing whatever it works for athletes i love that and i think that's why you're getting so much success and you have a good eye for talent you're a recruit you're a heavy recruiter it's hard to recruit against you <laughs> i was called oh this is gonna be a great kid like oh yeah i talked to coach luke i'm like oh damn it. <laughs> all right so you have a great eye for talent uh, how now with with all this you know talk about where you grew up and you had all this information but it was maybe filtered information because uh, there was uh, professional throwers. How do you think it's different now than all these high school kids? They have so much information out there, right? Because of the internet and uh, we, we didn't have as much, right? So what's, uh, what's the, uh, um, I guess, what's the benefit of having a little bit of information or what's the now danger of having all this information coming to you from all these sides? How do you, because you have athletes now that come from high school, right? They all uh, all these ideas. How do you sit down with them? Like, okay, let me <laughs> let's funnel this, right? How do you deal with that? It's a great uh, observation, and I think it's very accurate and true. Um, just in general, you know, there's a lot more information out there. There's you know different sites that are putting out throws materials on a regular basis. Um, you know, I think that's very beneficial to the general public and, you know, high school throwers for them to learn and get better and mm. have more proficiency and get there. Um, I, you know, it, it comes down to knowledge and experience versus um, 
you know, exposure. So it's like, yeah, I've, I've been exposed. Like, oh, do you know about the glide? Do you know about the spin? Do you know about cleans? Do you know the difference between a, a full clean and a power clean? But yeah, yeah I, know, I know that. I know that. And if the kid says, I know that, and they shake their head, and they, you know, the adult, the coach in that scenario is like, okay, cool. And I assume that they know. Every, I, I have to be smarter than that. I have to know that they don't know. Yeah, about the thing, they, yeah, they, yeah. yeah, they, they know something about it, but they don't mm -hmm. understand what happens if you power clean every day, like yeah. you know, bad programming or you know what uh, the cause and effect of opening the left side out of the back is going to do to the right leg, mm -hmm. you know, in a rotational event or something like that. So, uh, you know, over the last few years, I hear a lot of "woe is me" from our generation of like, "Oh, these kids, oh, these kids." But you know, I think when it comes down to it, like you know. You don't get to choose your parents. You're going to choose when you're born. So it's not their fault. So yeah. Yeah. just like anything, social media is a tool. And depending on how it's being used can be beneficial, neutral, or negative. So yeah. um, I think the information being out there is great. Um, you know, you can name them. There's a, a bunch of different, um, yeah. you know, platforms out there on social media that are, uh, you know, helpful for throws. But in general, I think most of those um, opportunities are helping athletes get exposure, get noticed and get, you know, potential scholarships to, you know, to schools to get on. And listen, we, we love the, the throwing events and anything that like this podcast, like, you know, Dane's podcast, like, um, uh, Arite's platform, like those are all good for the sport, you know, mm -hmm. and the rising tide raises all ships and everyone should get better because of it. Um, so I think that's very good. Um, I think what's, what could be negative about it is, um, okay, this is how I threw 60 feet in high school and I know how to do it because my coach taught me how to do it. And then if you come in and obviously that should get screened in the recruiting process and you should know these things, but I, I do think a number of, I mean, I could think of a handful of athletes right now that are in college that are struggling because they're still holding on to something. Mm -hmm. you know, from, from the past mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, getting on the same page with, with the college coach and getting some type of understanding or agreement or, mm -hmm. you know, even if we're watching the video together and we can talk about what we like, maybe what we want to improve on or, okay, may, maybe there's a piece that's in the future. Like maybe we're going to work on the next year or when we're ready for it. You know? And just having those type of young adult conversations, I think are so important because, yeah. You could send, I could send my video off to private coach and he could say something that's different than what my college coach said. Mm -hmm. And now the athletes in the position where they got to make a decision about like, coach, yeah. what are we like? You know, the, the, the responsible young adult would say, okay, coach, what are we working on? Like, are we working on the left arm? Are we working on the right leg. Because yes, you know, yes, 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 you, yes. you know, I know they're all connected. It's all part of the same chain. So there's a cause and effect there. So I think being open and having a good, open, honest relationship with coach and you know student athlete, I think is is the most important factor. Because without that, there's gonna there's gonna be some gray area, and in that gray area is where the miscommunication happens, yeah. and that's where the disconnect is. So. Um, I, I love that there's a lot of opportunities and people are making a living and, you know, maybe a, a partial living off of these, uh, you know, sites and yeah. private coaching and that type of thing. It's great because there's a probably 80, 90% of the kids out there in America that don't have a great proficient high school coach. At, at so at they got to go to, yeah, they got to go to, you know, mm. online throws school and figure out how to get better. And yeah. I think that's great. Uh, you know, service that's being provided. Yeah. But then, hey, there's a reason why, you know, you're hired at Virginia to be the throws coach. There's a reason why, you know, I'm hired at Penn State. Like, mm -hmm. they went through and interviewed the five or six best people, and they chose me. So, like, yeah. I'm the expert in the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it should be like, um, you know, an English class, you know, a history class. Like, I've read the books. I've read the studies like mm -hmm. this is my area of expertise and mm -hmm. you know, this is so, you know, having a good relationship with, with the student athlete, I think is the most important piece when it comes to that, because there is a lot of information out there and it's actually strange right now in this spring, you know, to scroll through Instagram and not see 
throw us up every day. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if we rewind the tape and look at like what that's like, man, you could, if you don't have a good head on your shoulders and know exactly what you're trying to work on and what your throw yeah. is going to look like, you know, this June mm-hmm. versus next December versus next June, like you could get distracted so easily yeah Yeah. and i think that's and it's very difficult you know the other major piece is comparison Mm. you know and if i'm i'm comparing myself to your throw you know that i see and everyone's posting you know for the most part uh Mm. you know a highlight tape of of you know the good things and this and that um but i think the comparison piece is really difficult too because it's not as easy to be focused in on the process that you're working on you know, with your coach exactly. and like, okay, what are we yeah. doing process wise? Yeah. Like, and how long does it take? You know, how long does it take to figure out the back of the circle? Yeah. You know, and it's different it, for is everybody, right? Like different. For yeah. Everybody. It's different for, I remember when I got to Georgia, we were working, uh, you know, coach probably watched me throw for two weeks before he really started coaching me. Yeah. And that was fine. And I look back on it and I think it was really wise because he was trying to look at the trends and tendencies and see what's common versus like, take two throws, what do you see? Take two throws, what now? It's like, yeah, yeah. it's the same throw. It's you throwing. Yeah. Probably a lot of, you know, 90% is similar. Mm. Um, but, and then we started talking about the back of the circle. And I think it was, I think we were working on the entry and the hammer and it was basically turn one from double support back into double support. And that's what we were going to work on. And he said, I remember him saying, so we're probably going to be working on this for about two years and then we can work on the rest. And my jaw was on the floor, man. I was like, what, two two years on this, on the, on the entry. I was like, I'm used to like, first of all, I think I'm a really good athlete. So I think I could fix that in like two throws, if not two days, if not a week, like I got this, I'll, I'll be able to like knock this out. And I remember going home for Christmas break and going out to throw, and my dad's asking, like, okay, so what are you working on? I was like, apparently my entry. We're going to work on it for two years. <laughs> I love this. I love what you just said. This is so important, guys. Uh, and I'm going to yeah. I'm gonna repeat this in, in our feed. This is so important, right? The process and how long it's going to take you to do it, right? right? So that's so true. I, I find it a million percent. I agree with you. It is yeah. great thing that you have so much information these days out there, yeah. but it's never, never uh, – you can never underestimate the process, how it longs to, you can, if you do it once, right? It's like, it doesn't matter. You conquer it, right? If, if yeah. we go another week and you're still, let's say, you know, uh, over, over out of the back, right? You're still pulling out of the back. Sure. Uh, you didn't do it, right? Like we yeah. did not fix that. So fix yeah. it. it's not one throw, you go over to the left. It's when you, when we don't have to worry about that for, you know, a couple of days or, you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Until yeah. it's out of you. That's, that's a really good point. And I think yeah. uh, us young coaches, uh, at least me, when I started, I struggled with that, right? Yeah. And I would get my athletes too, like, oh, you know, like you said, for instance, go over to the left and, and that was it, right? A couple of practices, great. Let's do another thing. Let's do a third now thing. Now in the middle, yeah. Thing. And then, you know, next thing you know, after two weeks, the, the entry is terrible. The head is all over the place. Everything is ruined, right? Because we didn't yeah. spend enough time. Yeah. We didn't have a long enough process for that to cement right it's sure. a part of you right yeah no i love and that. that's you know understanding what that process looks like and that's probably a, a piece that's very important to talk about in the recruiting process you know yeah. a coach asking an athlete what do you you know what have, what have you been working on like what was the technical piece that changed from sophomore year to junior year what are you going to work on this year and, and you know if it's if they have a list of six things maybe you can start explaining it to to them then that first of all, it's all connected, but you know, if you, if you fix the first kink in the hose, then the rest of the hose is going to flow well. Um, you know, and you're like, well, yeah, at at the end of the hose, there's, there's, there's this piece that's spraying out. I got to fix that piece. And then, you know, it just backs up. So, uh, that's a good, it's a good piece. And that's part, that's our sport, man. If you, if you want quick fixes and I need, uh, external um, validation. Uh, this this sport is going to be more challenging than someone that's yeah. that enjoys. Like I really enjoy training. I really love like oh man Wednesdays. I love Wednesdays because I get a snatch on Wednesdays, yeah. and uh, it's usually a little bit of a lighter discus day. You know, like yeah. someone that can embrace that type of regularity and like 
yeah consistency I, th- I think that's that's huge yeah i think that's why you were i'm not i'm not saying that you were not successful as an athlete obviously you were you won a ca title uh i think you are obviously your results prove that you are much more successful as a coach now yeah uh, all these all american all these titles that you have now is because you learned that right all, over time that you know that yeah. process takes time and, and and throwing right how many how many throwers in europe do you know hammer throwers they're doing other events and that they didn't start and they didn't start when they were 10 years old right and yeah. they're not throwing 10,000 throws a, day, uh, a, a year a right? year yeah so yeah. that's yeah. some things you just can't uh, neglect is the the time yeah effort put into it and a slow progress 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 even somebody like yeah. Ryan Krauser right kids you know youngest uh, Olympic champion or he was only 24 23 how old was he when he won Olympics right he started yeah. in his basement with his dad doing drills when he was who knows how old maybe six yeah. seven ten years old he was doing drills yeah he had yeah. decade and a half of experience before he you know broke the Olympic record right yeah it's not to be neglected yeah that's a I mean that's a great point And I, I know the Krausers and, and the way that they did it was very similar to kind of my upbringing in the sense of like, it wasn't pushed. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was casual. It was play. You know, they go shoot some hoops yeah. and then they throw some, th- throw some chocolate and then they go shoot some hoops and go fishing. Like, you know, it was casual. And that's, yeah. I think that's really important too, because our, our sport just isn't, isn't, you know, the, the, you know, the story about Todd Marinovich, the USC quarterback that was, uh, you know, very, very, um, pressing father. And there's an ESPN 30 for 30 on it. And it's always the Marinovich complex and, and that deal. It's, it's, it's not a great, that's not a great, uh, end game when, when you come down to that. I mean, this sport, you really have to love it, right? Like you have to love the grind. You have to hammer throw, man, your, your, your knuckles and your hands are going to be deformed for the rest of your throwing career. Right. Yeah. Uh, It's just, you have to, be enjoying the the process right the, the sure. everyday grind it makes you i think it makes you a more a stronger person in life uh just going through track now uh, man, it, yeah our, our, our sports is the best with that i think it has yeah. such such correlation i think all sports do but specifically yeah. track and field yeah i think uh, it's great to have a sport uh the team experience it's great to see what you can do with a team and i think also it's important to see what you can do when you don't have uh, somebody to lean on, right? Like in track and field, it's you, right? You have yeah. to do that work. You, um, If you have a great team like you, ha- you have, right, you t- 12 kids, it makes it easier. But at the end of the day, you got to get up. You got to make good decisions on your own. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Now, uh, I have a couple of questions, a couple more questions for you. Uh, sure, man. <laughs> and uh, that I think are, are very important that for recruits to hear. Let's say I'm a recruiter, you know, I'm a, a coach. I love what you have at, at Penn State, right? Will I succeed? I don't know if I'm going to succeed as an athlete, uh, as a student there. It's a very good academic school. I'm afraid I'm going to fa- uh, fail my classes. What kind of support system do you have for me, and how does the day look? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a really important thing to ask. And, you know, when it comes down to it, there's very, very, very few people turning professional in the, uh, you know, in track and field and in the throws. So that's kind of where we start almost all conversations is academics. You know, obviously we wouldn't be talking to kids if it wasn't for athletics first, but you know, there's, there's a, a really good 50, 50 balance there. So just like, um, you know, most of the coaches you've spoken to, there's um, all of the academic support that are for, you know, athletes only is, um, you know, I think that started right around when I was in school, you know, maybe right around 2000, something like that. Mm-hmm. That started to, to kind of trend that way. And then, uh, yeah, you know, I know when we were at Georgia, it was like, okay, newer facilities are being built and, you know, it's keeping up with the Joneses. So here at Penn state, we have a, a Morgan uh, academic student athlete academic center, you know, and it's, it's tied in, you know, in the athletic complexes. So, Your tutors, uh, you know, are taken care of and paid for. Your iPad is, you know, taken care of and paid for. Um, yeah. pre- either, pre- you know, private study sessions or group study sessions. Um, uh, if there's any, um, you know, need for um, note-taking or, or record-taking, those, you know, those types of things. It's pretty universal across the board um, when you're looking at Big what school. it looks like. And, you know, if you come to school and you're a – 
large scholarship student athlete or you're a walk-on student athlete, um, all those uh, opportunities are also being provided to you. So, you know, just I've, I've got a, um, a PDF that's an attachment that's 19 pages and, you know, that costs 27 cents on campus, but through athletics it's, you know, it's taken care of. Like those types of things are very nice. Um, we have study hall, you know, that's typically eight hours your freshman year and then you get over three O and then you bump it down and then by your sophomore year you move off campus and those learning skills are developed. So we don't necessarily worry about it after that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have, I, I check in, uh, the piece that I really like to do now, and it's more so now than ever before is, um, every second week I'm, I'm having to check in with the student athlete. So we're sitting down and I just want to talk about, um, you know, academics a little bit and then personal life. And like, are you, are you, are you handling cooking? Uh, you know, your sophomore year, you're moving off campus, you're off the meal plan. Yeah. Like, are you, how are you handling that? And I feel like those are some of the things I picked up when I was that age, maybe a year or two older, but in school of like, if I could streamline that and I can make that learning curve happen a little bit sooner, it's, it's just time that's going to be more efficient and, you know, result in a more happy, well-balanced student athlete. So I'm having everyone come into the office and we're trying to kind of touch bases on those things. I think that's helpful as well. So having a coach that's, that's well-balanced and, is keeping uh, the academics in mind. You know, at different institutions, it's it's a different priority. You know, yep. That's kind of where where we're at on that on that side. So, yeah, yeah um, we're throwing <clears throat> for the most part five days a week. Um, during different times of the year, we'll take a, a Wednesday or a Friday off. Um, we are lifting for the most part three days a week. Some of the javelin. Um, Athletes are lifting two days a week with a gymnastics session uh, for their third session. Um, we are doing uh, some of the stuff that I picked up as an athlete in school. We've, we've kind of, you know, morphed it and moved it around a little bit. But, you know, uh, the 20 minutes of hell, uh, that's something that, you know, like yeah. you, myself, and Newell have all like hung on to. And I just I yes. really like it. It works so well. It works so it's well. It's so simple. It's good. It's easy. It's like you can do it anywhere. You know, the, all the ingredients are in the title. You know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, keeping that piece in there. And then uh, I like to I like to play sports, you know, being basketball, football. So, like, I've kind of implemented our, our cardio. Uh, sometimes during the fall, like basically one day during the week, we'll play a sport. Wow. So it's some version of basketball, some version of soccer, some version of soccer tennis, uh, you know, that, that I picked up in, in Georgia as well. Yeah. And uh, – you know, if we were to line up and say, okay, everyone's running for 20 minutes, run, jog, walk, like the shoulders go down. It's like, yeah, oh man, yeah. this is hard. Um, but if you throw a ball out there and you keep score and then like, okay, it's 30 minutes and it's kind of open mm -hmm. gym, like that seems to be, um, you know, it's been a little bit more fun. And when I do have time, I try to hop in there still and keep that going. Um, it's mm -hmm. been really cool. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to balance that in season because I think that's, that restoration piece can be really good. Um, but it's, it's hard to take away from the throws. It's uh, exactly. And it's more important to do it in the fall. Uh, I remember when I came to, uh, to train with Mac Wilkins, it was yeah. the same thing. Uh, we were doing so much conditioning, but we were doing uh, runs on the, on the sand. Right. And with the uh -huh. sleds, I'm like, coach, why are we doing this? <laughs> right. He's like, Martin, you got, you got to build up your capacity. Right. So if you can, you know, lift, if your lungs are better, right. If you can get more air, you can do, do a little bit more in endurance. So you can do those 10 reps, eight reps, or, you know, a couple more reps in throwing. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where you build it up. It, it kind of goes down in, in the season, but yeah, it's yeah. hard to, to maintain that with the season going on. Right? Yeah, it is. But yeah. You still There's have the benefit. The benefit still stays there. Yeah, sure. There's only if you know five days in the week, and we need two mm -hmm. days off during season, yeah. and you've got travel. So yeah. there's some other <clears throat> factors over the last ten years that have kind of you know changed things around for the NCAA perspective. Yeah. But I noticed that when kids go home on Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, uh, even sometimes spring break, they come back. Those first that first session might be a little rocky. Yeah. The second and third session seem to be some of their best sessions in that entire month. Mm -hmm. And I think the trend there is like, okay, they've gotten some rest. They've had a little bit more time to just balance, yeah. 
maybe they throw two days at home instead of four, or they throw three days instead of five. Yeah. You know, it's still in there. They haven't lost it, but they come back and they're fresh. And I think mentally and emotionally, they're probably a lot more fresh, engaged, excited. Mm. And then they can come in and, okay, yeah, those first, that first session is a little bit rocky. But then they get it cleaned up, man, and there's something to that. So I think the four older model of, you know, five days a week, we're lifting four. You get Saturday off and then we're back mm. at it Sunday. Like, I think that's kind of going by the wayside a little bit more. I do think there are still programs that, are going to get it done with hard work and a lot of tonnage and, um, you know, just hard gritty kids. But, uh, like I said, with social media and everything else, and there's a lot of kids that know a lot about a lot of other programs. Yeah. I think there's a lot of those questions, uh, in there that, that, you know, are to be answered for those student athletes. Yeah. And then you cannot see those things, right? Like, like the study hall, like the attention you pay for your athletes, you don't put that on social media. Right. So I think that's important. And it's very Good helpful point. that you just, uh, you know, share that with us, how detailed or how comprehensive you are with your athletes, right? It's mm -hmm. not just throwing, it's school, it's life. Like, are, are you moving uh, off campus, right? How's that going? How's everything at home? Yeah. Right? And not necessarily yeah. you want to know every detail of their life, like, far, sure. far from that, but sure. you want to see if you can help, right? And I yeah. think it helps a lot when students hear that Coach, uh, Coach uh, McKay, he's like, oh, he cares about us more than just, throwing more than just points right and they, yeah. that gives so much more out of athletes too it, it puts them in a such a more positive environment right and then the, sure. the parents to know that this coach is cares for them more than just number uh he cares for them as, for, as academically personally right the whole life sure that's, no that's a good point i, I like that a lot that you uh yeah. continue to do that <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I, that's coming specifically from my experience like I think at times during college, I, I felt like a cog, you know, like, okay, you're, you know, you're a football player. Like there's three more behind you. If you step out of line, next guy's going to move next. up. You're very yeah. replaceable. So, you know, and I remember uh, Rob McIntyre, our strength coach at Georgia asking me, and it was in the middle of a workout, probably, you know, early fall asking me something about my parents and I remember stopping and looking at him like he was crazy. And I'm like, he asked like, you know, what does your mom do or what does your dad do like for work? And I remember looking at him like, and I'm sure my face was like, what does that have to do with what we're doing right now? Yeah. And it, it didn't, but what he, what he answered was, he was like, Oh, I was just, you know, curious. Like we're going to spend a lot of time together yeah. and I'd like to kind of get to know you a little bit. And I mean, that, that like hit me like a book on the head, man. I, right. I remember thinking about like that had been one, like I'd already been in college three or four years and that was the first time anyone had asked anything specifically about like my family or, or myself. Yeah. Like look at these guys, they, they care about me more than just my performance. Right. Yeah, man. And I think that was really important and that's something that's stuck with me for a long time and you know, maybe sometimes it doesn't show as much, but that's always, you know, the intention. No, I can I can uh, relate to that as well as you know being from overseas and yeah, uh, yeah away from home and these kids here just because you are still in US maybe you're out of state next state but you're still away from home you still yeah. this is the furthest you've been for a longest time right so I think it's yeah. very important for us coaches not to to forget that that these athletes also have some struggles and, and they like to know that people who are they spending the most time with now they care about them more than just yeah number right um so yeah sure yeah we become um, we now, become uncle go ahead yeah we we kind of become the uncle exactly right somebody said um and it's so true i will spend as as a coach way more time with this athlete than he will spend with his parents for next four or five years and then maybe you know five years after that I'm spending so much time with them, right? I, I, we don't take it. Um, you you should never take that for granted, right? That you are inf that you're a little bit of mentor, not a little bit. Sometimes you are a person that they solely look up to, right? Maybe sometimes you're not, but sometimes you are all that, right? So you gotta be uh, paying attention to that. That you don't you have this responsibility, wanted or not, to define this person's life sometime, right? Or or nudge them in the right direction, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's teacher mentor coach yeah yeah that's kind of the prioritization so coach one more question uh and then we can uh, we take a little break 
or we can wrap it up. Now, if I'm an athlete, this is the question I'm sure you get it a lot, uh, you ask a lot. So how far do I need to throw to get a full ride at Penn State? <laughs> or is there such a thing? Like, what are you looking for? <laughs> you know, so how it works with football and basketball, it's, you know, a scholarship or a walk-on. Like, it's one or the other. It's a full scholarship or it's a walk-on. And in track and field, like, as you know, you've talked about with Coach Nick Farr and Coach Newell and Coach Tar. We have between 12 and 18 scholarships, you know, between the genders and there's more than 12 or 18 people on the team. So it comes down to partial scholarships throughout. Mm -hmm. And depending on the program, uh, everyone wants to be a successful program. No one's in this to not be successful, oh, yeah. but it's successful at a conference level and then successful at a national level. There's kind of two different tiers there. Um, the amount of unsolicited uh, messages, uh, emails, or, you know, you know, direct messages or whatever that I would get that would say how, you know, poorly written, not thought out, how much, you know, how far do I need to throw to get a scholarship, um, in broken English are astonishing. It really is astonishing. And it's incredible to think that like, you know, not com compare Penn State throws to Alabama football, but like, could you imagine sending like a direct message to Nick Saban saying like, Hey man, like what's up? Like yeah. in casual language, like yeah. it's so inappropriate and yeah. it's so, yeah. uh, so that's, that's a pet peeve that I could talk about for a little bit. But, yeah. um, uh, the, the further I get into coaching, I think the less I want to give out a full scholarship. Mm. And I thought about this one a little bit just because like I've listened to your, 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 um, interviews so far and I, I I don't think I want to give a full scholarship I, I don't think I want to anymore I mm -hmm. like we have um, but I don't think I don't think I want to I think that with where we're at uh, now with student athletes and it's 2020 and everyone knows where they're ranked nationally and there's a new balance and there's a lot of people yeah. gassing up yeah. athletes for a lot of reasons and then it's like, okay, if I'm the best my junior year and then I continue to be the best my senior year, then I deserve yeah. uh, the full ride scholarship. And I think that's interesting. And like, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're the best in high school? Like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You can be the best in high school. It's great. It's tremendous. It's awesome memories. Those are all there. But then college is separate. It's a whole separate book. So like, what, it, what if you're going to go to uh, whoever won NCs last year as a team, uh, USC or Florida, or let's just use those two as, yeah. okay, those are the best teams. So yeah. if you're going to that team and it's going to take you three years to develop as a male discus thrower, then maybe you're worth 25%. And then you go in, you do well, you get bumped up to 35%. And then your next year you do even better. You got good grades. You're a good citizen. You're a good student athlete. Mm -hmm. You get bumped up to 45, 55, 65, 65%. And then you earn it within the program. Um, that's, I mean, I it's that. coming from where I'm coming from and like having spent all the time in the sport and all those things, you know, I get it. Like if I'm first in line because I'm the number one high school kid and I'm coming in that I deserve this, mm. that's what people are telling you. And that's what your private coaches are telling you. And that's what your parents are telling you. And someone put that goal out there for you and that's fine. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the athlete is worth it in the NCAA yeah. program. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the hard truth about it. And so the thing that Penn state has done before I got here and it's been a trend for years is we'll have a javelin thrower that's on 10% and they're in state. So obviously that, you know, that goes a little bit longer yeah. and then they come in, they get coached up, they do well, they're good. They're good students. They're good student athletes. They're good citizens. And then they, they've, they've gotten better. So Michael mm -hmm. Shuey, who's now, our U S number one job and thrower. He's, uh, you know, at the training center, um, doing a great job going to worlds. He, I think he went from, you know, 10, 15% to almost a full ride by his senior year. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I've two or three other athletes, um, in, in the javelin as well have done that. And that there's just, there's, we have this kind of equation that, you know, it seems to work out. 
Yeah. And you're going to get high level coaching. You're going to have a high level training group and you know, the, those things are, and I, you want to dangle the carrot a little bit. I understand that, you know, I just, I've got a son and we're going to have to pay for college at some point. And that's, I, I understand these things and every parent's kid is this, you know, the most special kid out there. And I want them to, you know, not to have to pay for college. And it's, I think for the most part, it's pretty, it's, it's kind of not a, a reality in, in the sport of track and field. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, someone that's throwing 70 over 70 feet in the shot put as a, as a male in high school, obviously they're the best kid out there. So it's going to, mm-hmm. that athlete's going to go to the highest bidder. And I, I just don't necessarily want to join in that game. Uh, the, the, the further I get into this thing, because maybe two out of 10 uh, of those athletes are still going to be really hungry, mm-hmm. you know, and want to go get better and want to work on their weaknesses and want to go beat people. But I've seen it more and more over the last decade that that like it's, it, that's the win is like yeah. getting the scholarship. Boom. And then they come in and you get a red shirt year and that, that year is gone. Then you get a second year and like, uh, maybe you're sixth or seventh or eighth. Mm-hmm. And like when it comes down to brass tacks, like, that's not money well spent from an athletic standpoint as far as scholarships go. So yeah. I want a kid that wants to come in and that understands the fairness of a, a half scholarship, uh, a 35%, 40, you know, 50% scholarship. Kovacs, Darrell yeah. Hill yeah. all did a similar deal. Come in, keep a chip on their shoulder, um, work their tail off, be good yeah. students, could be, be good citizens. And then, go in and sit with the head coach and say, Hey coach, look, man, I've got this, that, the other. And then, you know, that's kind of how we've done it. And there's a a good equation there. And, you know, it's not the easiest conversation, but if I'm talking to a kid and they're like, Hey, like I I can't, I'm not going to go to a school that's not offering me a full, then I, then that's okay. And I'll wish them luck. And, you know, or maybe one out of 10, I'm going to be able to go in and have that conversation. If I feel like, you know, that, that kid does want to, pursue some things post-college and uh you know be a professional thrower you, you know you kind of tell those things no i i love i love what you just said i think it's important for our listeners to understand this too uh coach mckay now is at that level that he can choose right <laughs> so uh you are at that level that you can choose athletes and because of that i think it's important and you know myself john mo obviously we've all been very successful now you get to really built up something incredible right not just get the finished product or uh, or suffer the 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 full scholarship athlete who's not gonna play play not by the rules but he's not gonna fit the uh, fit the team right so you don't want that you want and obviously you had a success uh, and it just i think it shows that attitude that you just had that you just said and that you have just shows how now you just you're not just believing that the process is important but you're living it right like you know so much you you know for a fact that the process is so important and you are willing to invest now in these athletes as much as you think you know uh, that they will get them there but you want them you want them more to learn how to be a thrower learn how to be a person earn that spot right because this is going to continue in your life this is what we talk about how many you just said how many athletes going to go pro right not not as many and if you don't have that habit and that work ethic, your life is not going to be easy. Like if you're just, if you, if you don't want it, if you don't know how to work hard for it, life is going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. If you go into a job interview as a sales associate and you have the best resume yeah. and like your goal was to like, okay, I'm going to have the best resume. Everything's mm-hmm. going to look great. I'm going to have these Excel sheets. I'm going to dress perfectly. I'm going to wear the right cologne. I'm going to shake yeah. the hand. Like I'm going to impress them so much. And that's as far as you thought. You don't have the work ethic afterwards. Yeah. Like it's not going to end up well. So yeah. that's kind of how I'm comparing it. But I, 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 you know, maybe it's me getting old and being a little bit more cranky. But I'm definitely seeing that more frequently than maybe I had before. Maybe I wasn't looking for it. Mm-hmm. But uh, being in a position now to you know be a coach and be recruiting and and, and sign student athletes, that's definitely something that I'm trying to protect a little bit more. Is yeah. protect the program protect uh you know the the group and the group psyche you know and all those things because 
you get one or two bad eggs, you know how, how negatively it can really affect yeah. everyone's yeah. experience of what practice is like, yeah. what the weight room might be like, you know, it's, it's not worth it. And yeah. I love that you, you're not willing to sacrifice the culture that you have for somebody just because he or she is throwing, you know, far or is number one in the high school. You want them there because they want to be there, right? Because they want to get better because you already have proven that you can make NCAA champs and you get this amazing education, right? You're going to have this degree for the rest of your life. You're going to have a community that supports you, right? In the institutions like this Penn State, UVA, Berkeley, right? These schools that are very high academically, big schools, right? They don't have to be as high. Georgia has a great alumni association, right? That's also... I don't think uh, parents realize or athletes that that go also goes into the price, right? You get this label, boom, I'm a graduate from Penn State forever. I'm a UVA alumni forever. You say, oh, I graduated from this school. Ooh, you graduated from that school, right? That goes into a price a lot of times. Uh, that's the, that's the, sometimes that's the handshake that gets you into the room to have the conversation. You know, then it's up to you, but, yeah. you know, uh, I, I remember two things like in the, in the college processes, you know, after one in C's, my dad telling me that like, they can never take that away from you. Like yes. you'll always be, you know, uh, you know, this looks case it's a champion. Like it's, the, it's, the, it's that tagline that always comes yeah. with it. The same deal. It's in like, uh, this is Lucas McKay, uh, mm-hmm. Georgia grad, like those taglines come along with it. So in the recruiting process, that's a big piece as well. And, yeah. you know, at different schools, um, you know, that maybe you might not have as much, pride or affiliation or something too, maybe a small mid major or one of those coaching jobs along the way, you know, that piece isn't what you're going to recruit with. Mm-hmm. But now being very proud of, you know, being at Penn state in a school that like I can sell and a program that I can sell like that, that part has become a lot easier. It's something that I like, it's something I'm putting out front in the recruiting process. And then the athletic piece is coming along kind of later. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, you, you're bringing a lot of experience with you. You have a lot of success, obviously a lot of knowledge, and you're at the great school. You're making it really hard for us, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I know. I wish I wish all my best friends in coaching could be in like four different corners so we didn't have to mess with each other. <laughs> yes, but I'm glad you're um, not in my conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, at And least John is not in ours. I, I think that we're perfect. We're at different conferences. Yeah, different conferences is definitely helpful. Um, yeah. Being proximity wise is not is not good. Um, I know there's one recruit that we can think of that was you know talking to both, and it's like, oh yeah. man, I'm like that. But no, but I, I think it's great um, that we continue to do this, right? Uh, I think it's amazing that students do have options uh, and you know get to know your coaches, but also get to know do some research on what they have to offer, what's their experience, and what, what that school that they are at brings you, right? Because it's going to change you for life. Penn State, UVA, Berkeley, Tennessee, right? Any big schools, it's going to change you for life. You're going to be the person that is that is defined by four or five years being in this in this institution. So that's, a, that's also something to look at. Who's your coach? Who's going to coach you, mentor you? It can be a small school. I, I, I don't care where Mac Wilkins is. <laughs> right i am going to that <laughs> school he's not coaching the school obviously but something like that right so yeah we both had that affiliation with mac and same deal i could you know we could name five coaches that are at schools that are not mid-majors and you know their their knowledge is unparalleled and their success is you know on that on that same level and, and uh, if that coach if that coach is at the great school Man, that's what I'm saying. You're making, you're making it really hard. <laughs> yeah. All right, Lucas, a couple more questions. Uh, I said that a minute ago, but this is last two, and I want to let you go. I know you have a kid uh, to take care of. You're a busy man uh, with all the uh, the programs that you're, I'm sure, writing now, calling recruits. So And recruits, when it comes to that. Now, we have juniors that didn't have a season, right? So a lot of, a lot of questions that I get asked, and I'm sure you do too, is what can a junior do that hasn't competed, but they were ready to throw out, out outdoor some good results, and now they're not on the map? What do you? What's some advice you might give, or how do you look at that? Thing it's just ensuring you know we're gonna find you. Don't worry. Our job is to find you. Yeah. Your job is to train, get better, and communicate. It's it's simple. Nobody needs to freak out. The sky isn't falling. Yeah. Like we're 
everything's going to have a season. Uh, athletes are going to go to college. So this might give you a little bit more time to focus on, you know, working on your weaknesses, which is nice. So, I mean, uh, I think recruiting and coach athlete relationship comes down to communication. So this is a great opportunity for us to see how you communicate. So, um, record yourself, um, put two or three videos, uh, compile those, um, in an email, have your parent maybe proofread it. Um, you should write your email. Your parents should not write your email. Um, when it comes down to that, this is your experience. Your parents are preparing you for this experience, but then you need to be the one that's taking the ownership in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so send videos, communicate, you know, you need to reach out, do the research. Like, you know, some coaches have said before, um, there's so much information out there. Look online, find out what Penn State, like what conference are we in? What, uh, you know, are the top 10 marks? How many people are graduating? How many people do you have on your roster mm, in yeah. the given throwing events? Do I know any of them? Like do, do 30 minutes of research, you know, on each school. You've got plenty of time. Uh, kick yourself off Instagram or Twitter for an hour. And if this is important to you, then spend a little bit of time doing your homework. And, um, you know, do that research and then you have a well thought out email when you reach out to, you know, coach McKay or coach and, and then, uh, then I read that email and I'm impressed by that email. Cause I'm like, Oh wow, this kid has done their homework. They see that we have two javelin throwers graduating and they're a javelin thrower and they do this other javelin thrower that we used to have but right off the bat. I feel a connection with that student athlete versus, uh, Hey coach, how far do I have to throw to get a scholarship? Like one line, like you're texting a friend that you've known for years, yeah. um, which is incredible that, that, that people do that. But yeah. you know, maybe if they, you know, if they see their friends on Instagram and then they see, you know, UVA throws on Instagram, maybe you put them on the same level. Therefore you write casually like you would write to a friend. But uh, you know, that's, that's something that we have to filter out and deal with, but you know, I just, it's going to be hard to take that, that prompt more seriously than, you know, a well thought out email. Uh, for instance, I was emailing with a, a student athlete today that's looking for a, a, a grad school opportunity, but like the email was well thought out, did the research. It took me a day or two cause I didn't have time to write a well thought out email. I, I responded and then he responded within an hour and it was like, it's just, it's a good relationship to build off of. And you look at like, okay, is this kid going to pay attention and like be thoughtful and prepared for a workout? Yeah, most likely because you can see that behavior, you know, on the front end of it. So yeah, for the juniors, listen, this is a great opportunity for you guys to maybe spend some more time throwing. You don't have to spend two, three days on the road to go to that meet that you had to go to. And um, I think the biggest factor as well uh, that we talked about earlier is like, how much do you want to do the work in the darkness and the shadows and not get the credit for it? This is where we're going to see that behavior. So are you continuing to work? Are you finding a way to, um, you know, be, be creative for, with your workouts, right? Yeah, man. Are you able to, yeah. Okay. Like I'm not able to clean 200 pounds cause I don't have a good gym, but I've got, a barbell and I got some kettlebells and I got like 25s like, okay, cool. Like bump your reps up to tens and yeah. you know, do what you can do and how much create creative work can you do with that kettlebell? And I mean, go, good Lord, there's programs online left and right that are free. And especially during COVID right now, I mean, people are really offering out their expertise for, for, for no charge at all or very reasonable prices. So we, you know, we're getting a chance to really look, under the hood a little bit more and see the personality and like, well, well season is done. I'm not able to lift. And if yeah. you're throwing your hands up at this point, then, you know, that's, it's, it's revealing. So I think it's really important to, uh, you know, put your best foot forward and be creative with your training uh, and spend some time doing a little bit of research so that you can communicate thoughtfully uh, with the prospective coaches and, you know, start with uh, a, a big list and then get funneling it down by the start of, uh, the, end of the summer, say, you know, so that by your senior year, you can get your list down and you can uh, communicate well with your coaches and then get your visits set up 
um, because we don't know exactly where how, how what the fall is going to look like right now, man. Yeah. You know, there's talk of schools being online in the fall, so like that that will affect this recruiting class mm-hmm. certainly. That if we're online in the fall. Uh, you know, for students, and they're not going to bring thousands of students back to campus because they might have to send them away, then we're most likely not going to be able to bring student athletes and prospects yeah. and parents official visits, right? on onto official visits. Yeah. You know, hadn't really thought about that until talking about it live right now, but that may be realistic. So all the more important that I have a good relationship with you over email, uh, over Instagram, Facebook Messenger, over uh, the phone so that we can talk a little bit more and um you know get a feel everyone there's so much uncertainty right now with this so you know you know having, having that good rapport with the parents and with the family i think is you know, would be really helpful uh, this time around so this junior class you guys kind of are a certain you know specific living through a specific you know time in history right now and we all are and it's wild and it's you know it's it's very new and uncertain but uh you know the wheels are going to still turn. So I think working on your communication and just being open and honest about stuff and taking advantage of the time that you have is yeah. kind of the key. Yeah. These are some, some great nuggets of wisdom uh, coach you just gave us. So hopefully guys, you took some notes cause uh, <clears throat> this is very valuable. Every coach now will appreciate it so much. Like you said, if you take 30 minutes of research do a uh, do on a school that you want to send that email to, uh, and if you communicate with a coach, m- write a nice email. It goes a long way. And if you continue to communicate and, and tell the coach, hey, coach, I can't go outside right now, but this is what I'm doing right in my backyard, you know, being creative. I'm doing all the drills, right? I can't throw out. Or I have a big backyard. I can throw in my backyard or the, this park that there's nobody, right? That goes a long way, like coach said right now. And this is very important. If there is no opportunity to have official visits this fall and this is your only opportunity is to talk to the coach, you better take the opportunity and make the best out of it, right? Don't start the conversation with, hey, yo, how coach, you know, what's up, <laughs> right? And because you might not get the chance to visit that school this year, right? So and if you do, that first initial contact is so important. And I think you gave a lot of good advice right here uh, that I'm going to uh, forward to as well to my recruits. <laughs> It's good to have these conversations as well because we're all on a little bit of an island right now trying to figure out what it means. And, you know, we're waiting for legislature to be passed down from the higher ups to figure out what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And, yeah. You know, those pieces. But, yeah, it's definitely uncertain times. So, yeah. Coach McKay, where can the athletes and parents get in touch with you? How? What's the best uh, source? Or Yeah, no. Um, so, uh uh, all the socials, uh, I think on Twitter, it's Coach Lucas and uh, our Penn State Throws uh, Instagram page, uh, I help run and um, uh, through the Penn State uh, email system is, uh, you know, very straightforward uh, way to do it as well. And if you look online, the, you know, my, my, my bio email and, and phone number are on there. Um, I know this is going to be reaching millions of people, so I won't throw out my cell phone number. Um, but yeah, the, um, the Instagram, uh, obviously, uh, it's a little bit tough to put out content right now because we have some NCAA legislation that's, um, you know, not allowing us to put out any type of, uh, you know, current content of what athletes are doing, training at yeah. home, this, that, yeah. the other. But um, that's, you know, always when things are a little bit more normal, it's a pretty uh, easy way to communicate and, and see what athletes are doing and mm-hmm. that's definitely a great way for this junior and these prospects right now to Do the research, keep right? people aware of, of what you're doing because uh, all of us coaches around the country have uh, a lot more spare time that we're not at practice right now so we mm-hmm. have plenty of time to yeah. peruse uh, the socials and, and see what's going on on that front but uh, yeah man I'm on Twitter I'm on Instagram and um, yeah, email is a great way to do it as well. Well, thank you, Lucas. This is a lot of uh, a lot of nuggets of wisdom. Like I said, you shared with us and your experience through the high school, uh, childhood to college to coaching is, is quite uh, quite impressive. So, thank you for sharing that with us and taking your time. Thank you so much, Luke. Martin, man, thanks for having me on, dude. Um, maybe if we do it again, we can get into some good. Uh, 
thrower stories and uh, fishing tales and yeah. uh, maybe uh, pass on some more knowledge that way as well. Yeah, yeah, some experiences. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right, man. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, Luke. Thank you.